most people I know usually try to put their best foot forward. You know, they get cleaned up. You know, if someone's coming over, you got to clean the house. Someone's, uh, you're getting ready for church, you got to put on your Sunday best. <laughs> Poor dog. <laughs> Man, little did he know that I was going to be uh, working on the garden <laughs> all around me. <laughs> Had to transplant some tomatoes and uh, take some out of, I got tomatoes everywhere all around me. You can't see them back that way or over that way, but anyways, there's tomatoes all over the place. But in order to get the tomatoes in their locations, I had to transplant them, kind of. You know, take them out of one pot, put them in another. And in so doing, man, I made a mess. <laughs> and that's kind of what most people don't want to admit. Making messes. You know, they don't want to kind of talk about making a mess of their life or making a mess of their wife or their kids or maybe just making a mess, period. And me, I never had that chance, you know. My messes were kind of obvious. You see, I never had the opportunity to put my best foot forward. I was too busy tripping over my own feet that, man, it was kind of obvious that I fell flat on my face <laughs> regularly. As a matter of fact, I already forgot what day it is, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to pull up a devotional today. <laughs> Just kidding. Sort of. <laughs> but the thing I learned very on in ministry, which, as most people know in Didibo, I personally believe that ministry started the moment you got saved because, after all, you got saved. <laughs> so from that moment on, you had something to talk about. But anyways... <laughs> which means that I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> Talking, that is. <laughs> but uh, one thing I learned was that people that put their best foot forward often don't know what to do when their feet give out or they trip up over themselves. They went out there and put their best foot forward and then they fall flat on their face and then they go, whoops, now what do I do? And they get so embarrassed or so ashamed that they can't own up to or they can't admit that that's what grace was for in the first place. God already knew you were a mess. Now, the fact that you mess up doesn't come as a big surprise to God. <laughs> it wasn't like God said, hey, I'm going to save you. Now go be perfect. Okay, maybe he said that, but that's not exactly the way that he meant it. You're not going to be perfect until you arrive in heaven. You see, you're living in something that's imperfect. Your flesh is imperfect. Now, I don't care what you do to it. You know, you could bodybuild it. You could puff it up, you know, like, you could blow it up, you know, kind of like, you know, steroids. You can, you know, decorate it. You can, you know, make it look shiny or young. You could shave. Oh, I hate shaving. God. <laughs> you know, I do it because it makes people feel better because <laughs> they don't like looking at my face. <laughs> but boy, the older you get, if you're like me, you just hate shaving because it's kind of like, man, it bugs your face no matter whether you use an electric razor or, you know, a scraper razor or whatever, a sharp razor or a straight one or, yeah, triple edge, quadruple edge or, you know, 16 edges. <sighs> I wish we could all go back to, you know, where God said, hey, you know what, bearded is better. <laughs> but, you know, we live in a society that we do what we do. We put our best foot forward. We look the best we can. We look shiny. We look good. You know, we look customized. We look metro. <laughs> Whoa, be careful there. But, you know, everyone has their own idea of what they want to look like. So they make themselves look like that. Me? Man. I come out a little different every day. <laughs> Some days I wear hats because my hair, I'm having a bad hair day. Some days I wear sweats, you know, because I'm cold. <laughs> and it's cold out here. Some days shorts, some days, you know, suits and ties. And, you know, I actually, believe it or not, I like dressing up. You know, I kind of like putting on suits and ties, but I, I like doing it out of the ordinary, not as the ordinary. It's kind of fun. 
dressing up that is. And I like what God does, you know, because he takes people that are ordinary and dresses them up. He makes them into something that they were not. It's kind of like putting on, you know, the image of Christ, putting on Jesus, so to speak. Even though he's living inside us, he makes us look better than we actually are. And sometimes we get caught up into that. You know, you get caught up into thinking you're better than you are, when really the best that you are is a far cry from the best that he is. And that when you kind of accept the fact that you don't have to dress up to be accepted, when you don't have to put up, you know, some kind of airs or some kind of special, you know, suit of armor, you know, huh, or be something, you know, that you're not because you're not a robot, you're you, then suddenly there's great freedom in realizing that even if you mess up, it's really not screwed up. You see, you already were planned for being forgiven. You already were taken care of when you mess up. When you make a mess, like I did, you know, with all the dirt and everything else, well, you know, I happen to have a broom along, you know, <laughs> that I could clean up. And, you know, we have bathrooms and showers and all those things to get cleaned up when we want to or when we ought to. And God has his own way of doing that in us because he's always at work both to do and to will of his good pleasure throughout eternity. But at the same time, he has promised himself by himself that he was going to do something to you that you couldn't screw up no matter how hard you tried. Now, I know some people think that there's an extension to grace at some point in time, but the reality of where we are at as far as knowing God being bigger than we are it's true we don't know who is saved but those that are are saved forever now who they are I don't know <laughs> so somebody you know down the road is not saved doesn't surprise me God knew I didn't know you know it's kind of like Judas you know yeah you know but I don't look around for fruit in a tree you know to find out if it's a fruit tree you know I just eat the fruit Hey, I enjoy you for who you are. You know, if you're saved, praise the Lord. I look forward to seeing you in heaven. If you aren't, praise the Lord. Down the road, God will take care of you. <laughs> Ooh, flush you somewhere, and it ain't going to be down the toilet. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's heading towards the wrong direction. But you don't have to be that way. You see, God doesn't really pull the lever on your life and say, Oh, you blew it. <laughs> That's it. It's over. Instead, he chooses to really kind of do those, you know, like reconstruction projects, you know, kind of like those sewage treatment plants. You know, he puts you through kind of this treatment process that turns your refuse into fertilizer. And you begin to grow someone's life up into who they should be in the Lord. If you take your life and use it for something that God intended it to be as opposed to what you're doing with it. And that's kind of how God takes what you do from do-do to his will. Because you see, when you're doing your own will, you're kind of like doing your own thing. And every time you do do your own thing, you make doo-doo. <laughs> and believe me, I've seen a lot of people make doo-doo out of a lot of things in life, including ministries. But eventually, people get used to this whole idea of God can take doo-doo, add a lot of water, you know the word, you know, kind of like you know a lot of Bible in there, you know, kind of wash it real good, you know, and put a lot more of the, you know, solid stuff, you know, the ground, the good soil, you know, and he mixes all that dirt in with water, and it's almost like his own kind of special sewage treatment plant. You know, he takes your doo-doo and makes it into fertilizer, and then he uses it in someone else's life in order to minister to them. So, your mess-up could be a bless-up. Yeah, really. God takes mess-ups and makes them bless-ups. You know, blesses someone else to lift them up out of where they are. In other words, your screw-up became God's do-up. You know, he's redoing you. He's giving you a new do. Hey, cool. Man, I got a new do. Ooh, I'm good. <laughs> and I thought I messed up. Well, you did. <laughs> really. But God wanted you to realize that in your personal growth, it's also affecting others around you so that they too could grow up into the fullness of the stature of what God wants them to be. So don't be so discouraged when, you know, you really you know, can't put one foot in front of the other, you know, and you kind of trip over yourself, you know, and you're always trying to think you have to put your best foot forward. 
fact is, the only foot you got to put forward is one foot in front of the other and keep walking, keep talking, keep living, keep knowing Jesus in a personal, intimate way and relate to him everything in your day. That's why our lifestyle model, our choice of direction, you know, our, our focal point that we always use in this ministry, you know, Vidivo, is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I mean, hey, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding, you know, you know, lean not in your own understanding, period, you know, but in all your ways, that means everything, you know, acknowledge him, you know, just not just say hi, you know, but, you know, acknowledge him, you know, and he shall direct your path, because if your path is directed by God, and you're heading down the road according to his directions, whatever you run into, if he gave you the directions, he knew they were there. And if he knows they're there, then he's got a plan for it because he wanted you to go to it, to see it through, or to go to it, through it, and do it, and get past this idea that somehow all these circumstances don't have a purpose. That all of life is somehow some cataclysmic, you know, working out of some, you know, megalithic uh, type of nerve, type of uh, kismetical, how's that for a word? Kismetical, <laughs> or kis, kismophorical, I like that better, you know, of kismet and circumstance and accident, you know, and prone to some kind of like, well, it'll kind of work out, sort of. No, God planned it out specific detail, hair on your head, hey, get it right, get it good, and get it with God. Every hair on your head is counted. In my case, that's a lot of hair. <laughs> Matter of fact, I got hair everywhere where it shouldn't be there. And most old people do. <laughs> oh my God, I got hair on my nose. Ah, pull it off. Ah. <laughs> but God counts them. Give that back. <laughs> I'm losing one of my hairs. I had 1,275,675,889. Well, eight now. <laughs> but God, for whatever reason he wants, you know, counts them. He's not bored, but he's that detail-oriented. And that's why your life is so coordinated by him and not you. You may think you have an idea what the big picture is. But as high as the heavens are above the earth, so his thoughts are above our thoughts and his ways above our ways. And there is no real understanding thereof. You think you know, but you only know a portion of what he wants you to know at the moment that you're putting one foot in front of the other. Because if you knew all the things that he had planned for you, first of all, you'd be blown away with joy. Then you'd be terrified with fear. <laughs> then you'd be running out of here. <laughs> because believe me, <laughs> wow! If I thought I knew what was in store for me the moment I got saved, I might not have got saved. <laughs> Dare I say, man, it would have killed me because getting saved almost killed me. I nearly died two or three times <laughs> since I've been a Christian. Wow. <laughs> it was a rough stuff. <laughs> but boy, with God, hey, it was cool because here I am today. kind of enjoying who I am, such as I am, the way I am. Kind of like when God said, I am that I am. You see, God didn't try to explain to Moses, look, this is my name. God didn't try to tell him, look, run around telling everybody I am. No, God just tried to tell Moses, look, you don't get it, you know, I'm God and you're only like creation. And because I'm creator or, you know, I'm so much bigger than you are, you just don't get what I am, much less who I am and how I am. So, I am that I am. It's, it's just the way it is, you know, and we accept God for as he is because of who he sent to represent him. And if you wanted to see any type of limited version, so to speak, of God, then in the flesh, you would look at Jesus and you would see the Father because Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Hey, check it out, man. We, you know, we would have the same nature, you know. I'm God, God's God, you know, God's Father, God's Son, God's Spirit. Well, guess what? Even the very, you know, Godhead is revealed in creation and all of the, you know, things are revealed by nature and we can, you know, kind of look at it and say, you know, root, stem, hip. You know, all these little things that we kind of get a hint at what God is. But just like 
something that's created doesn't really reveal the creator you know, of it. You know, just like you know, you are the sum total of all your parts. <laughs> well, God is kind of like bigger than the sum total of everything that we create that is created. He's bigger than that. And so we get an idea of how God is operating in our lives by how he operates in our lives. But that's not the fullness of it. You see, the reality of all that God has said and that all that God will do will still be found in his nature. And his nature is love. God is love. As much as you think you know what love is, and you don't, you know, because we have these fleshy ideas of feeling and a feeling that we call love, there's something else that's something from the spirit that we don't know what is. We call it agape, we call it all these Greek words, you know, play with it and try to think that we understand it. Uh, pardon me, but, you know, calling a, a feeling a fruit, you know, just doesn't quite cut it for me. You know, it's like, I don't get it. You know, well, you got to get it, because you got to eat it, and once you eat it, you got it in you. When you got it in you, it's going to, you know, produce what it was meant to do in order to accomplish it purpose that it was sent forth from God, which is what we call the Word of God, but also in the realm of the Spirit. <gasps> the fruit of the Spirit? Hmm, that might be sustenance indeed. You know, love, love in, love out, guess what? <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> oh well. But that's how there's more to what we can't see than what we do see. And what I can see is when we act like something we're not. We trip up over our own idea of what we think we should be as opposed to how God sees and the way we are. You gotta live in the skin you're in. You gotta live who you are. You gotta be you. You just gotta be as you are, the way you are, honestly. And when you do, then God isn't surprised with you. You get clearer vision of who he is and how much he loves you. You get a better perspective of what grace is and how to deal with others. You get a better reality of life as opposed to trying to make life fit into your reality and putting on glasses and changing your style and your makeup and your image in order to fit into something. Quite frankly, you were never intended to be. And that's how God operates. He likes to treat you as you, the way you are, the same way that he is, who he is, the way he is, which is why he said, I am, and which is why you are who you are.